Hi everyone, uh, today we're going to be talking about the sampling distribution of pre uh, and how we can actually transform that proportional reduction in error into the more commonly used F distribution. Um, as you might recall from the previous module, we're going to be discussing uh, how to draw inferences from the statistics that we observe in our sample. And specifically, we're going to be talking about using the proportional reduction in error and the F distribution in order to do that. So in class, uh, we're going to show how the sampling distribution of pre kind of emerges using simulations. And we'll also show then how kind of the flip side of that is the sampling distribution of the F statistic emerges uh, due to simulation. Um, for now, we want to focus on sort of two key concepts, is that the proportional reduction in error is always going to be greater than zero in a situation where we're comparing an augmented model to a compact model. Or sorry, greater than or equal to zero in a situation where we're comparing the augmented model to the compact model. Um, the augmented model certainly could explain e uh, no variance, right? It could, it could have a, a sort of a proportional reduction of zero, but in general, right, if we're comparing a sample mean against a population mean, the sample mean will always be the best approximation of the data. Therefore, it's going to be always a proportional reduction error of greater than or equal to zero. And if you're fuzzy about that, go back to our previous video um, or, or take a look at the readings in the chapter. Now, the other thing we want to keep in mind is that the larger the proportional reduction in error, the less likely um, we think a result is to have occurred by sampling variability alone, um, given certain you know, assumptions of our distributions. Um, but that is, if, if variability explained by our estimate is large compared to the residual variability, we think there's something systematic and therefore statistically interesting happening in our data, rather than something you know, random happening in our data. Uh, and we want to be very careful in how we interpret uh, these probabilities and we're going to talk a little bit more about that at the end because the calculation of these probabilities or these p-values depends very much on certain assumptions that we make about the statistical model that we set up in the beginning and whether or not sampling variability is the, the only factor operating on our data. So this is again why we talk about it being very important to know your distributions, right? In order for us to make an inferential statement about the probability of observing a pre um, of a certain value or larger, we need to make an estimate about the variance in the population. And as we've shown, the sample variance is an unbiased estimate of the population variance. So our population variance is sigma squared. We can't really know what that is in most cases, but we know we can get an unbiased estimate of it by calculating the sample variance, or s squared, which is the sum of squared errors within our data divided by n minus 1. Once we have that, we can actually start to make some calculations about the sampling distribution of the proportional reduction in error. Because once we have an estimate of the population variance, the other two things we need to know are the number of parameters that we're estimating and the number of observations in our sample. Because as we talked about in the previous video, when we talk about the F distribution or the sampling distribution of pre, we're really talking about, uh, or, or well, I mean, it's really a distribution that's conditional on different variables. But a, a good way to think about it is that it's actually many different distributions. Because because we have one for, for instance, if we're estimating one parameter and we have 10 observations. But that sampling distribution would look different if we were estimating one parameter and had 50 observations, or if we had one parameter and we're estimating 100 observations. And these two factors, the number of parameters that we're estimating in our model and the amount of data that we have, sort of work against each other when we make inferences about the proportional reduction in error. In general, the bigger our data set, um, even a smaller change in the proportional reduction of error will be interesting. However, um, if we're estimating lots and lots of parameters, right now the change, a small change in the proportional reduction in error isn't very interesting. Because as we said, we expect pre to go down for any given parameter. Therefore, if it takes 10 parameters for me to explain a very small amount of data, that's not a surprising change, um, and they probably aren't very meaningful. Okay, So that's how those two things are sort of balanced against each other when we're drawing an inference about the uh, statistical likelihood um, of observing a particular proportional reduction in error. So, like we said, uh, however, critical values of pre and its sampling distribution are relatively rare in statistics textbooks, and instead it's much more common to see perverted, uh, pre converted into an F value um, and interpreted with respect to the F distribution. So in this video today, we really want to talk to you in some detail about what the F distribution is and how we're going to be able to use it to draw inferences about the data uh, uh, in our sample, or from the data in our sample.
So the F statistic is actually based on the proportional reduction in error, um, but it is scaled to the number of parameters in our model, um, and uh, it's a ratio of the variance that we're explaining against the variance that remains to be explained. Um, so this is the formula for calculating the F value. You can see that we have F uh, is equal to the ratio of pre divided by the parameters in the augmented model minus the parameters in the compact model divided by one minus pre, uh, which is in itself divided by the number of observations minus the parameters in the augmented model. So uh, this isn't the most intuitive formula, so we're going to color code it and try to walk through the different pieces. Okay, so first, if we consider what's happening in the numerator, we're looking at the proportional reduction in error per parameter, right? How much variance is actually being explained um, compared to how many additional parameters did we need to use to explain that variance? So we're saying, how much variation are we explaining per parameter? And then we're scaling that to the remaining or residual error, right? And so one minus pre is any variance that is unexplained, right? We have um, our starting sums of squared errors. Okay. When that initial sum of squared errors changes as we go from model C to model A, and that's what gives us the proportional reduction in error. So 1 minus pre is going to tell us how much error remains as a percentage, right? How much unexplained variance is there in our data, uh, and how many remaining degrees of freedom do we have? Essentially, how many additional parameters could we still add? So we get a ratio of the variance explained per parameter uh, proportional to the residual variance per um, remaining degrees of freedom. And so if we explain a lot of variance with very few parameters, F is going to be really big. If we either explain very little variance um, or we have uh, a, a lot of parameters, right, that F is going to get a little bit smaller, right? And you can think about what's happening there in the, uh, in the denominator. Um, and then this also uh, has a similar effect down here in the, uh, or sorry, in the numerator. And then down in the denominator, you can see the effect that we have uh, if, we, if we don't explain much variance. This is going to get bigger, so there's more residual error proportionally to be explained. Uh, and that's going to drive F down. Um, but if we have, for instance, a very large data set, right, if N is big, that's going to make this denominator smaller which ultimately is going to make the F ratio bigger. So even in a very large data set, if we have a relatively small change, um, it, it might be a, a large F value, right? So we could have one parameter that explains a modest amount of variance, but we have 10,000 people. Okay, so there's these, these different moving parts here, but there's how much variance are we explaining, right? How much variance remains to be explained? How many parameters are we using to explain that variance? Uh, and how, how many sort of free parameters do we have? How many degrees of freedom do we have left in our data set? And all of those things work together to influence the F statistic. Um, and then we also then can use these things to draw particular F distributions. And in lab, we'll explore several different F distributions in order to try and understand the likelihood of observing a particular F statistic the same way we've done with Z values or Z, T, T values. So the F value then, right, uh, to kind of summarize all of this, is it can be interpreted as the ratio of explained variance to unexplained variance, taking into account the sample size and the number of parameters. And the bigger our F value is, the more variation we're explaining in our data, keeping those other factors constant. So a particular F value then can be compared to the F value for the appropriate degrees of freedom. So the F distribution, as we've said, changes as a function of the number of parameters, which we call DF1 or the numerator degrees of freedom, right? So you can see here the number of, the, the difference in the number of parameters is in the numerator. So this first one we refer to as the numerator degrees of freedom uh, and the number of observations minus the number of parameters. So this is degrees of freedom two or the denominator degrees of freedom. So depending on how many additional parameters we have, and how much, how many remaining degrees of freedom we have, that's going to change the shape of the underlying F distribution. And like I said, in lab, we'll spend a bit more time generating these distributions, but here we're showing you the sampling distribution of the F statistic with one and nine degrees of freedom. And scaling this back, right, to our example of looking at does the flu actually increase your body temperature, 
the degrees of freedom in the numerator was 1 because we were estimating one parameter in model A, whereas we weren't estimating any parameters in, in model C. So 1 minus 0 is 1. And we had 10 people in our sample. So n was 10, right? And we were estimating one parameter. So 10 minus 1 is 9. So the null distribution, right, of the F statistic with 1 and 9 degrees of freedom looks something like this. These are the F values that we would expect um, as a function of the uh, probability of observing those F values um, given pre equals 0. Right? If, the, if the true pre in the population equals zero, um, how would these f values be distributed? And you can see that we're going to have a lot of f values that are relatively small, right? and then we're going to have a much lower proportion of f values that are big. So bigger f values are more statistically unusual, right? um, and we're really interested then in how, how big is the f value that we observed in our data. And we can compare that um, to this distribution. And what we'll want to do is plot the particular f value from our data over the top of the distribution to then make a decision about is this f statistic unlikely to have occurred assuming our null distribution um, uh, and assuming uh, sampling variability. So our pre, as you might recall from the previous video, was 0 0.603. Okay, so pre is there. 1 minus pre is down here in the denominator. Our degrees of freedom in the numerator were 1 minus 0, and then in the denominator were 10 minus 1. So we can kind of work through the math, right? And this becomes 0 0.603 divided by 1. Uh, this becomes 0 0.397 divided by 9. And if you crunch those numbers, ultimately you end up with an F statistic of 13.67. So 13.67 is a pretty large F value. You can see it's all the way out here. Um, there's very little in our distribution, right? If we took the, the, the mass of the distribution that's in this tail, uh, there's very little of the F distribution that's that far out or farther. So assuming the null hypothesis with 1 and 9 degrees of freedom, we would expect to get an F value of greater than or equal to 13.67 about 0.005% of the time due to sampling variability alone. And sort of the concise way we would write this statistically is to say given our F of 1 and 9, right, so our numerator degrees of freedom and our denominator degrees of freedom, we observed an F value of 13.67, which given the null distribution has a probability of about 0.005, right, so that's the probability of observing an F value this large or larger given the null distribution for an F with 1 and 9 degrees of freedom. So this is statistically unlikely to have occurred by sampling variability alone. So we would probably conclude that people who have the flu um, might actually have higher body temperatures than people who don't have the flu, right? Because it is very unlikely that we observed this sample just by chance given our assumptions, right? So we have to make some, some qualifying statements there in order to interpret this p-value correctly, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But this would sort of be strong evidence against the null hypothesis, right? If we were to say, well, we don't think that having the flu actually makes a difference. We think that any variation we see is due to sampling variability. Well, if we had had an f of 1, that would be perfectly likely, right? An f of 1 is not at all unusual. You know, an f of 2 is starting to get a little bit more unusual. And depending on how sort of conservative we want to be, um, we might raise the bar for evidence against the null, uh, against the null hypothesis pretty high. Um, but an f of 13.67 makes it pretty unlikely that this arose due to sampling variability. And we would conclude that there's probably something systematic going on in our data. For instance, that people with the flu do indeed have a higher body temperature. Um, and this is a statistically interesting result. We probably would not ignore this and, and, and we wouldn't treat it as a fluctuation in our data. We would think that there's something systematic going on. Like I said, though, we do need to be careful about interpreting these p-values, and we need to be very cognizant of what p-values are and what they are not, um, because there's a lot of emphasis placed on p-values in the scientific literature, um, and there's a lot of problems with how people interpret them. Uh, even in my lectures or in casual conversation, I might talk about the p-value with sort of a shorthand uh, that doesn't capture 
all of the information about it. So this is kind of the first time we're going to pause and really talk about the p-value. But in subsequent modules, we'll also talk very carefully about what the p-value is and what it isn't and how it provides one very robust answer to a particular question, but we need to supplement it with lots of other statistical information, theoretical background, and context in order to use that p-value to really guide our scientific decision-making. So given a particular null distribution, the p-value is the probability of observing an effect that large or larger, assuming that sampling variability is the only factor operating on our data. P-values then indicate how incompatible the data are with our pre-specified statistical model, or the null model. Okay? And they, they answer that question uh, very well, uh, and they, they, you, can, you can demonstrate the, the, you know, sort of the mathematical formalisms underlying the p-value, and they provide a very concrete answer to a very particular question. Okay. But we need to make sure that our assumptions uh, for a particular distribution are reasonable. So, for instance, this is why we have to do things like checking the normality of errors, because the p-value, or I should say the accuracy of the p-value, is contingent on the null distribution and what we assumed. So if we assumed a distribution that ultimately isn't correct, our p-value ultimately isn't correct either. So it's important that we check those distributional assumptions for our errors to make sure we can interpret p-values correctly. It also means that we have to sort of control for other sources of bias through our study design, right? Because if we're saying that we think that there's, uh, we're calculating this p-value based on a particular null distribution that assumes vi sampling variability, right? Random draws from one sample to the next. Are we really selecting people randomly, right? Are we really assigning people randomly? Or is there systematic bias in our data? Right? So for instance, if I am not randomly assigning people to groups or not randomly selecting people from the population, I might actually be influencing my data um, in a way that, the, um, you know, that, that, that basically my model isn't designed to account for. And therefore, I could give myself a very big effect size or a very good looking p-value um, because that, that assumes that sampling variability is the only factor operating on my data when in fact I was going out and, and not recruiting, you know, like in our flu example, maybe I was only recruiting the sickest looking individuals uh, and I didn't give sort of an unbiased uh, assessment of do you have the flu or not we'll take anyone with the flu if I only said well I'm gonna take the healthiest people and the sickest looking people um, even though there were a lot of people with the flu who didn't get into my sample I would be contaminating my data and sampling variability wouldn't be the only factor operating on my data so then it's also important to consider what the p-value is not okay so uh, people make a lot of um, poor judgments about the p-value and there are misunderstandings about the p-value and a lot of this is propagated through you know scientific literature or scientific education and sort of rules of thumb rule of thumb ways that people learn to talk about the p-value maybe in their in their lab um, but the p-value is not the probability that your result is real or true um, it's not the probability that the result was observed by chance alone, right? This is kind of an attractive shorthand, okay, but it's, it's not chance. It's not the probability that a result occurred by chance. It's assuming a particular null distribution and as, uh, what is the probability that this result or a larger one emerged due to sampling variability, right? So it's, it's, this one ha has some truthiness to it, uh, but it's not an accurate description of the p-value. It's also not the probability that your alternative hypothesis is correct, right? We're saying that given a null distribution, how likely is it that we observed an effect of this size or larger? Now, that doesn't mean that the null hypothesis is wrong, right? Even if the p-value is very, very small, this doesn't prove that the null hypothesis is false. It just means that result was unlikely. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, hits versus misses and, and sort of false positives versus false negatives in subsequent lectures, right? But it's important to remember that unlikely things happen all the time. We could have a p-value of 0 0.001, Right? Uh, that just means one in a hundred times. But how many tests did we run? How many experiments are run on this topic overall? Right? Uh, how, do we, how do we sort of balance our result against the context of the number of observations that we've made? Right? Unlikely events do, do still happen. So we can't ever conclude that the null hypothesis is totally false. We just have evidence against it. And we have to draw a line somewhere at the point where we think that evidence is compelling um, or where we don't find that evidence particularly compelling. Um, the p-value also doesn't speak to the probability that another researcher running the same experiment 
would get the same answer, right? We might think that if I get a statistically significant result, that means that my result is real, right? We know that's not true, see the point above, right? But it also doesn't mean that someone who ran the same experiment would also get a statistically significant result. P-values fluctuate quite a bit um, as, as a function of the effect size, the variance, and the sample size, right? And we actually have to start to consider another property, something known as statistical power, if we want to think about the probability that another researcher running the same experiment is going to get a similar result. And finally, the p-value by itself is not an indication of the size or importance of the observed effect. Uh, and this gets into some interesting discussions around what might be statistically significant versus what is clinically significant, right? And although we might have the statistical power to measure a very small effect, if that effect isn't a meaningful change, are we really interested in implementing it? Right. And so there, this, this, is, this is kind of a big topic and there's a lot of things to consider here. Um, and, and I think a lot of the times people kind of just then think, well, I'll ignore p-values because they don't tell me about clinical significance. Um, but the p-value is an important part of that conversation. As we've seen, right, clearly the p-value has some limitations and we don't want to have any misconceptions about what the p-value really is, but it is still a very useful and informative piece of information that tells us about the probability of observing an effect of a particular size um, given the null distribution. So we want to make sure that that null distribution is correct, but if we can at least, um, and, and, and we can usually make a very good approximation of the null distribution, right? Based on what we know about sampling distributions um, and, and uh, sampling from different types of parent distributions, right? We know that the normal distribution of errors is, is a very compelling model and is going to be accurate in a lot of situations. So we usually can make a good um, assumption regarding the null distribution, but we do need to check that that assumption is correct. And assuming that it is, the p-value can be a very useful tool um, for helping us decide is an effect statistically interesting or not, um, but it shouldn't be considered in isolation. We need to consider the theoretical and empirical context of previous work. We need to consider the size of the effect, and we also need to kind of consider the, the estimate and the variability in our estimate. Um, and all of these things need to come together to influence our scientific decision making. Because ultimately, you know, science is hard uh, and it's through discourse and a lot of different experiments that we're going to generate new, new facts uh, and new information.